Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome our virtual audience, as well as those in the audience, to this presentation, the Homestead Act of 1862 and Southern Black Homesteaders. My name is Bernice Alexander Bennett, and I'm a genealogist, an author, and a homestead descendant. And my name is Jessica Corgi, and I am a park guide um, at Homestead National Historical Park. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys have much experience with the National Park Service or if you know what a park guide does. Um, but we are in the business of connection, much like a genealogist. Um, genealogy is about connection too, isn't it? <laughs> Connecting people to history and unveiling stories lost to time. That is exciting and meaningful work, not unlike a park guide. <laughs> who works to facilitate meaningful personal connections between the national park sites and their national significance. Did you know that there are 428 national park sites across this nation and territory? I wouldn't be able to name them all, but I bet at least all of us have heard of at least one, this one. Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. Lots of people uh, shaking their heads to that. In fact, you know what? Clap if you have visited Yellowstone. Nice. It's quite a few. Um, why don't you guys clap if you've been to Homestead National Historical Park? Yeah, there in lies a problem. <laughs> trying to connect people to homestead is, is interesting because that's what a park guide does, you know? And there is a map of all 428 national park sites. And there is Homestead National Historical Park, right there in southeastern Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> um, and why do you think that they would place a park there to tell this enormous story of homesteading? Anybody have an idea? They have lots of room. They have lots of room. Yes, we did. We had lots of room. <laughs> um, well, that is actually on the, the site of one of the first homesteads claimed in the United States. So January 1st, 1863 is when that homestead was claimed. I like to call homestead the Yellowstone of stories because the impact of the Homestead Act is so vast and there is so much exploration to do. Recognize that guy. <laughs> Signed on May 20th, 1862, the Homestead Act shares an anniversary with another very important piece of legislation. Does anybody know what that piece of, of, of legislation was? I heard it out there. Bernice, do you wanna, do you wanna share? Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Um, and this was a land law that accelerated sediment of surveyed public lands for a minimal filing fee and five years of continuous residence. To claim a homestead, uh, you would have to be head of household or 21 years of age. You could be a man or woman. They wrote that into the law, man or woman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you did not need to be a citizen of the United States. You just had to declare your intention to become a citizen. And um, within the five years of the proving up period, you would earn your citizenship. Um, you could not bear arms against the government. 
Um, and you also would have to cultivate the land. You would have to build a house. And then you would have to prove that you did it. 30 states were homesteaded. Did you guys know that? Does anybody know when the Homestead Act was finished? What year it was done? It was 1976 for the lower 29 homesteading states, and then it was 1986 because they kept it a little, uh, open a little longer in Alaska. And uh, 123 years later, 270 million acres of land was distributed and patented to private citizens. We're going to get to that. <laughs> I'm working my way to it. <laughs> so the impact of the Homestead Act is enormous. <laughs> The impact to the land, technology through the years, agriculture, westward expansion, these are all themes that we talk about. But the people side of the story, the people side of the story is enormous. And even you are being impacted today. It was a big deal at our park a few years back when we received assets for the park's website from a black homesteading project conducted by the UNL Center of Great Plains Studies. Twelve stories of black homesteaders from six black homesteading communities in the Midwest and their historic land entry case files came to me. And my job was to place them onto our website. And after I got done with that, I thought, <laughs> But there's 30 states, right? <laughs> there's 30 states. And so wouldn't it be nice to get black homesteading stories from each one of those states? But, but it's difficult. There's a little bit of a problem there. Race is not put on those homesteading documents, you guys. <laughs> and so you know how remote we are. And so trying to reach out to people to find out if they're descendants is, well, we have to get creative about that. And so that's when I let my fingers do the walking, started looking on the internet, and I found Angela Walton Raji. She uh, had a blog online about her homesteading ancestors. And so I took a chance, <laughs> and um, I gave her a call. And we um, started talking about the Black Homesteaders Project, and she agreed graciously to do a video with me about promoting the Black Homesteaders Project for our website, for our social media, so we could get the word out. And she kept talking about this lady named Bernice. <laughs> and um, when I finally contacted Bernice, we all began to segue into something remarkable. And a grassroots movement to find homesteaders in all 30 states began. And stories lost to time are unveiling themselves. And what is really remarkable as we learned more about the homesteaders that left the South, but what we are uncovering are the stories of the homesteaders that stayed in the South. These stories are not known. Most people don't even realize there was homesteading in the Southern states. And so it's remarkable that this historical narrative that we are illuminating has brought us here, has brought me to Bernice. And I'm going to let you take over. Thank you, Jessica.
And so when Jessica contacted me, she said, you know, we, we have this project, and I'm kind of hoping that you'll help me. I want to see if we can find black homesteaders, descendants of black homesteaders. And I said, well, Jessica, sure, we can do it. You know, we have our network. She said, what network? I said, we're all over the place. We have the Afro-American Historical Society. We have the Midwest African American Genealogy Group. We have so many opportunities to share the message. That is that you should think of your ancestors as owning land. Now, let me tell you what happened. I started putting on Facebook, did your ancestors own land under the Homestead Act of 1862? And the pushback was, no way. I don't know what you're talking about. We were enslaved. No, we didn't get any land under the Homestead Act. And I said to Jessica, oh, we're going to continue this. We're going to continue to educate people because the more you educate, the more people will try. And this is what happened. So Jessica shared with you the map. Of course, there are 30 public land states. And most of the time, the focus has been on the Great Plains. But what happens when you then turn around and people will say, let me take a look. Let me at least think about it. And what happened was stories started to be told. So I'm going to take you through the process that I went through to encourage individuals to search for their land. Because we're going to talk about five southern states. Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Now, are any of you descendants of homesteaders from those five states? Oh, great, wonderful, wonderful. Well, when you look at this, this is a chart. And this is a chart to show you how many proved up in the various states. So just look at Alabama for a second. 41,000, 41,000 homesteaders. Look at Arkansas, 74,000. Florida, 28,000 plus. Louisiana, 22,000 plus, and Mississippi. Now, wouldn't you think with those numbers, we should find some descendants of black homesteaders in those states? We can't walk around saying no, they were not there, unless you start looking. So I started looking in the newspaper just to see if any information was in the newspapers back in the day that really encouraged folks to apply for a homestead. By the way, the process was the same. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're a woman, whether you're a man, everybody went through the exact same process. So this is a, a newspaper article in 1866. The fact that Negroes are allowed to secure homesteads under the laws is one fact which ought to be public. That was said in 1866. And some pains taken to communicate it to them as they are not readers generally. Then the other new feature that all the public land are subject to homestead law is not known. So this is 1866 and here we are in 2024 talking about this. In 1878, another newspaper article was in the New Orleans Daily Democrat. And they state there were no entries in the southern states until 1866. And in Louisiana, not until 1867 on the account of the war. And what war are we talking about? The Civil War. So why is discovering and telling Southern black homesteaders' stories important? As genealogists, 
we want to share. We want to find everything that we can about our ancestors and share their stories. We want to expose ourselves to new discoveries. And also, I want you to think of this as a passion. When you're telling your ancestors' stories, this is your passion and it's also your mission. And this is a photo taken of descendants of African-American homesteaders last February at the National African American Museum of History and Culture because we were there to tell our story. Now, I want you all to understand that we had black homesteaders, descendants, writing stories from other states. Michigan, Dr. Shelley Murphy submitted her stories for, for Michigan, Missouri, Oklahoma. So there are other states where we did gather stories, but one of the things we noticed was a large number of descendants sharing their stories from Louisiana. So how did they get started, and how would you get started? First of all, the Bureau of Land Management. The one thing I tell people, it doesn't hurt to look. Did you grow up hearing that somebody owned land in your family? I know I did. Did you look in the census and did you see your ancestor listed as a farmer? I know I did. Did you see that they owned land? Yes, I did. And so I'm going to share with you the story of my ancestor, Peter Clark. Now my grandmother told me that her granddaddy owned a lot of land. Now, Grandma, I love you, I believe you, but I have to find proof. And so this was one way for me to do it. I went to the Bureau of Land Management. I put in his name, Peter Clark, and I saw that he did obtain land, land in April of 1896 in Livingston Parish, Louisiana. I also continued to go through this website and found out that he went to the office, the land office in New Orleans. You see, if somebody's going to apply for something, they have to go somewhere. And he traveled to the land office in Louisiana. Now, I know that this land was under the Homestead Act of 1862 because it's listed here on the document. And he did obtain 159.33 acres of land. Now the whole goal of obtaining this land was to obtain a land patent. And that's just the transference of the land ownership from the United States government to individuals. And if you're on site and you're looking at the Bureau of Land Management, for that matter, ancestry, you will find something that looks like this. This is a land patent. And this is my great-great-great-grandfather, -grand Peter Clark, with his son, Moses. And my grandmother gave me this picture. So not only did she tell me that he owned land, but she also provided me with an image of her grandfather. And this patent has his name, Peter Clark, the location of the land, the number of acres that uh, President Grover Cleaver signed this land patent, and he received it on the 8th of April, 1896. So let's say, how many of you found something like this? You did. <laughs> One person. We and found it, Bernice. Yay, we're done. Oh, we're done? Yeah, we're done. Oh, we found oh, the land patent. We found it's the over. land That's patent. all the information we're going to find. Okay. Do, do you, is it over now? <laughs> That's all you No. First of all, in the 1900 census, he is listed as a farmer, and he is listed as owning his land. But do you think that's the end of the process, folks? If you get the land patent, I want you to understand that's the end of the process, I want to take you back to the beginning of the process. 
Nobody's just going to give you a land patent. No, you have to do something. And this is what the descendants were taught. They were told, if you find a land patent, I will make it possible for you to take it to the next level. And the next level meant getting your land entry case files from the National Archives. And we were very fortunate to be able to get those land entry case files for individuals. And there, these are all the boxes. Yes, I ordered every single box, and I found folks in all of these boxes. So what can you find in a land entry case file? So much valuable, wonderful information. And you know, we decided, let's make this very colorful. What's the settler's name? Where was he born? What's his age? Where did he or she settle on the land? When did he settle on the land? Where is the land located? How much was the filing fee? Yes, they needed a little money. They didn't get it free. They had to file and pay a fee. So you have to understand that when you're going through a land entry case file, you're going to see a receipt. You're all go also going to see the improvements that were made to the land. And how many individuals live with him or her in the household, you're also going to see either they signed their name or they used an X. You will also find witnesses. Some people may call this the fan club. I love witnesses, folks. I mean, when I see a group of witnesses, I go crazy. I mean, really, I track them. I'm, I'm a hound dog. <laughs> but when did they obtain the land? How many acres? I mean, you're going to find all of this. So let me just give you just a little bit of what I found in Peter Clark's file. First of all, when they brought me that box, and I opened the box and saw his file, I felt like all of the ancestors were standing behind me looking. I had chills. I, I was so excited because it named the place where the land was located. And so he applied April 25th, 1887 in New Orleans. He had to travel to New Orleans. He was not from New Orleans. He also said, of course, that he's a citizen. And then there's a questionnaire. There's the testimony of the claimant. So I know that Peter Clark said he was 38 years old, and he lived in Marpa, Louisiana, the place my grandmother told me the land was located, and it was in the document. So I tried not to do the happy dance, folks, but I'm telling you, when you see something like this, and you know you've been told this, you want to do the happy dance. He said he was born in Louisiana. So I didn't have to look anywhere else, just as Jessica said. Folks didn't leave the South. They stayed. We're looking at the people that stayed in the South. They're also describing that land. And they're trying to make sure you are the identical person that applied for this land. Yes, I am. Then they ask the question about the value. What did you do? Because remember, they have to improve the land. They can't just apply and not do anything, because then they won't be able to prove up. And so he then said, well, my house was built, and I established actual residence on the land over 10 years ago. I think that's my 1890 substitute right there. I, I could say I know where he was. He had a dwelling that was valued at $50. He had an outhouse, $5 and five acres he cleared and fenced, and it was valued at $50, the total $105. And then they wanted to know, well, who's in the house with you? Of my wife and four children. And in, at the, in the 1900 census, I could see who they were. And my grandmother was one of those children in that house. Also, you'll find a newspaper clipping which is so exciting because the newspaper clipping has to run for six weeks. And that newspaper clipping listed the people that he identified as his witnesses. 
So I told you I followed all the witnesses so I could, that's a whole nother story. I know about every one of them. But then something happened. This is the part that brought tears to my eyes. Because after he lived on that land for 10 years, he didn't have the money to go back to New Orleans to get put in his final application. And he stated, he is a very poor man. And that until today, he has not been able to get money to pay the cost of making proof. And this is the earliest day he had the money. That he has lived on the land, established land in good faith for over 10 years, and it would work a great hardship were he deprived of his entry. I want you all to know, Peter Clark got his land, and this is the original land patent that one of my relatives has right now. So happy dance all over the place. So when you're thinking about looking for land records and telling that story, you want to pull all the different documents you have discovered on your ancestor into one big journey story. Peter Clark was on the Freeman Bureau record. I found his marriage record, plat maps, I mean, track books. All of that combined to tell me about this man. And I'm just going to go fast through these just to show you. He was, he, he was on the register. This is the plat map. And I went to the courthouse. You know, I have to go to the courthouse. We all have to go to the courthouse, right? I went to the courthouse and gave them the parameters. This is where he lived. Can you tell me who has that land now? And can you give me something? And this is what they gave me. And my dear friend, Leonard Smith III, said, let me see if I could find this land on Google Map. And he put what this courthouse gave me on top of Google Map, and that's how Peter Clark's land is identified. And this is just, uh, just additional information that you'll find. So how can these records assist you in your genealogical journey? You will be amazed at what you will find. So I'm just going to give you little snippets of what happened when some of the descendants looked at their land entry case files. This is a file for Irving M. Bass. This is one of Angela Walton Rogge's relatives. She calls him Uncle Irving. Well, Uncle Irving had an entry in his file, and it said, I was off the place for the purpose of going to school at three different times, staying away not longer than six months at a time. Now, what did that good genealogist do? She said, well, I want to know what school you went to. And she found it. She went to the catalog of the normal, the Branch Normal College of Arkansas. And she found this at the Library of Congress, and there's Uncle Irvin in school. Just what he said. It came directly out of his file. Well, here's another one that really brought me to tears when the descendant started reading her file. And the question was, are you a native-born citizen of the United States? And look what he said. I am native-born citizen of the United States by virtue of the Emancipation Proclamation of President Lincoln. Although he didn't say he was black, who was emancipated? <laughs> he just told us. And so this is his grandniece, Mrs. Maud Humphreys. And the entire family took a pilgrimage to the land in Florida. And she's holding a jar with the soil in it. This is another homestead entry, which was quite interesting. This man, Mr. Thomas Pittman, did put in an application in 1899. But he canceled his application on the 19th of September, 1903, through a relinquishment file in New Orleans General Land Office. 
And he did this because he, in a sworn statement, he stated that he is a colored man and alleges that acting on the advice of friends, he relinquished the entry for reason of threats of contest by certain white citizens. He's willing to risk the proof because he thought about it and he went back and he said, I changed my mind and he got his land. Now, I mentioned to you that they're newspaper postings. And one of the things that I strongly encourage people to do is read everything on your records, everything. And so listing in this newspaper posting was the name of the register, Walter L. Cohen. Now, I'm from New Orleans, and we had high school called Walter L. Coins, so we knew about Walter L. Coins. But what I didn't know was that Walter L. Coin was appointed to the Office of Customs Inspector by President McKinley to the position of Register of U.S. Land Office. So Walter L. Coin is an African American Register. I had no idea. But it's because, and when I say read everything that you see on a file, because his name is in all of these homestead records, I said, we have to look him up and know who he is. And that particular person that I showed you who applied was named Josiah Cyprian. And Josiah named several people as his witness, and this is where his land is located. And this is a site called History Geo. And I was able to also look at where those witnesses are. And many of the witnesses live near him. So how can you share your discoveries? Because this is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about sharing your discoveries. Tell people, share the stories. You could also become an author and contribute your homestead story to a book. You can also consider preserving your family story at the Library of Congress. And then, ta-da, write and submit your homestead story to the National Park Service. And this is how my friend here connected, because so connected. I'll go was to get those stories yeah, told. Yeah, I mean, so here's an example of, of Margot Lee Williams. She uh, took her the work that she found, and she c submitted a story to, to the National Park Service, but she is also wrote um, and has a website that you can find her story. Click two, two, one more. Or you can, you know, with the book, you, you can, can write become books. a contributor. And these are all descendants of black homesteaders that contributed to a book called The Black Homesteaders of the South. 49 stories in five states. The two largest number of stories were from Louisiana and Mississippi. But you see real people here. These are people that we didn't even know each other. We didn't even know had land patents or had ancestors that had applied for land until the grassroots efforts started. Yeah, this is true, this is true. And so now we have a, a website, it's on Facebook, and it's called Descendants of African American Homesteaders. And individuals are encouraged to join this site because every time a story is submitted to Jessica, I put it off. I do a blast. I tell everybody, let's congratulate this descendant for sharing that story. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about writing your homestead story and submitting it to the National Park Service. Um, and I also wanted to share that I have personally learned so much through this process, 
there is so much still for me to learn. <laughs> um, but writing your homestead story and the stories that have been submitted to the National Park Service um, have all been submitted as well with their historic land entry case files. And this is really, really important because when somebody says, there's no homesteaders in the South, and they read a story written by a descendant, well, we've got the proof. We want to digitize all of the land records to share which, with each and every story. And we're, we're having to do it right now one by one. So as each person submits a story, we put those documents online for free for you and for future generations. So here we have some helpful hints. Now you can go to the National Park website, just nps.gov, and you can just keyword search, write your own homestead story, and um, this page will, will pop up. Or you can just write black homesteaders, and you're going to encounter this as well. Super easy to navigate, super easy to find. Um, so you have to get your documents out of the National Archives, and from there, um, Oh, this is a video, isn't it? I should be playing it. Whoop. And it's gonna start scrolling down here. So it gives you some links to the National Archives, more about the General Land Office records. We have examples. We've got Peter Clark and two more examples there that you can see how they did their stories. And then there's some assets that we put into the website, the quick facts. So we ask folks to please fill that in as much as you know. Um, and then there's a series of questions that Bernice helped um, to create a template, if you will, for you to use in order to write your homestead story. So you might just be learning that you're a homestead descendant, but you can still contribute the story and broaden our narrative of homesteading in the United States. So through these stories, I've been able to meet a lot of people, and I've been able to rope a lot of people into basically doing videos for me. <laughs> and this is a great way to um, share when you get to see people. And these are the Griggs twins. And I would like you to see. Hi, we're the Griggs twins. My name is Denise, and my name is Dolores. And we want to talk about our family, basically the Hunt family of Southwest Mississippi. The spark that led to discovering homesteaders in our family, I had the land patents, but I thought they purchased the property for our third great grandmother, America Hunt Harrell. We had never heard of homesteading in Mississippi. By the time she received her land patent and homestead, she was our age, 72 years old, and we were just so tickled about that, that here, a woman coming from slavery, being a concubine of the slave owner, having children by him, and being the cook in the family and at the plantation. So within that 20 years of being emancipated from all of this, she was a bit, uh, able to get a successful homestead. Her house was a 16 by 16 square foot log cabin, but she was very proud of it. And she said that she owned a, a bed, table and chair, uh, two donkeys, a horse, a bureau, and a corn crib. Three of them, as a matter of fact, and they were all made out of logs, including her cabin. Look at how much we learned just there about their family. <laughs> All from federal documents, you know? It's, it is inspiring how much you can find. And, and so you saw an example of what one of our web pages looks like on the National Park Service site. You scroll down, you are gonna get a link to the Bureau of Land Management site. You're also going to get to those historic case files. Now with the historic case files, I do wanna share, because the National Park S Service um, is very, very, um, well, we need to be very accessible to everybody, we have to trans 
transcribe those documents, which means that those documents have to be written out. We need somebody to do that. And uh, through this project, uh, Homestead, um, and through our volunteer coordinator, uh, Amber Kirkendall, we started a digital volunteer opportunity for people to transcribe historic homesteading documents. And now we have transcribers all over the world helping. Um, but staff at the park, is limited right now. And so we're sitting on a lot of these documents that still need to be placed online. So you might find stories right now that do not have their, their documents with them. Just wait, they'll get there eventually. The most important part is to get your stories out there. And if you get them to Homestead National Historical Park, they are going into a repository. They're there, they're safe. They're there for future generations and we will get them online eventually, okay? And when we started, the Southern uh, homesteaders with, with um, the number of them online, um, well, do you know how many we had, Bernice? Zero. We had zero. But None. now we have Hold on, here we, oops, no, nope, that's not what we want. There we go. But now we have 67. <laughs> yeah, we have 67 of them right now. Um, so we're gonna scroll down. This is our website. This is the front page of our website. Uh, there was a, there's a documentary that Bernice is in that we just produced over the summer. Um, there, there it is. <laughs> It's about a 20 minute documentary, definitely go check it out. Um, and you can just start, these are just Southern Homesteaders, so you can start scrolling down and seeing all of the names. And just curious, is there anybody in the audience that has contributed to this project yet? Ooh, not yet. So we'll have to see if anybody finds their homesteading ancestors. Um, where are we at on time? I wanted to add a little something about the historic case files, if you don't mind. Um, the historic case files, you're gonna find probably, and this is where I see a lot of confusion with the case files. Sometimes I see case files that are like eight pages. Sometimes I see case files that are like 55 pages or even more than that because you find the regular paperwork, but then in the proving up paperwork, you um, have to fill out surveys, and you saw some of that with Peter Clark's work. But your witnesses also have to fill out those surveys too. So you have three accounts of people talking about the homestead, okay? Three accounts. And the witnesses, if you go to related documents on the uh, Bureau of Land Management, like when you're on Peter Clark's site, there's a related documents up top, that's what you click to get to your witnesses, and you just start going down the rabbit hole with each one of them, and you start building communities, you start finding neighbors, you start finding more black homesteaders. Um, do you have anything that you would like to add? Not only do you find that they are also homesteaders, you may also find that some of those individuals were members of the were former members of the United States Colored Troops. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the exciting things that you can do is marry the records. If they have a pension file and they have a homestead file, you are now reading the life of that person. And one of the stories that was told is Josiah uh, Cyprian. And I did marry the two because I have both files. Well, what do you think? Should we open it up to uh, some questions? Yes. We would love to hear your questions. And also, we'd like you to, you know, we have feedback. We'd like to know what you thought about Let's this Let's have session. a chat, people. Let's talk Let's about it this. now, folks. OK. I called my friend and she was on the train and I said, oh my God, I was like, you have a black homesteader. And she goes, 
that's a big deal, that's important. I'm like, <laughs> yes. And because of that, um, her story is on the website, which I think is so cool. So I think communicating, educating everyone about what the black homesteaders are, or just homesteaders in general as well, is important. And so I'm happy that my friend was able to be a part of your book. And it's just an amazing project that you're working on. And thank you so much, both of you. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And thank you. Yeah. for sharing that information with her. Because some people may find a patent and not realize that they need to take it to the next level because yeah. that's the end of the process. Yeah, and did you know, here's a stat we throw out there. We, we like stats in the National Park Service. <laughs> um, one in three citizens is a descendant of a homesteader. Yes. She ha I have a whole bunch of those. She has like seven of them, I think. Yeah. She didn't even know how important it was. So no, thank and, you for the education. And I find with most people that are coming to our park, um, because we are so remote, like some folks are coming there specifically because they want to visit homesteads. Some, it's a happy accident. <laughs> And so they're learning about the park for the first time and the Homestead Act for the first time. Um, and, and, you know, and that's where, where I come in to try to, to connect them to the park site. Um, but I wanted to share that um, I was for sure that I was not a Homestead descendant. And, um, yep, I am. <laughs> you know. <laughs> we see another hand up? Yes. I have really enjoyed this site and been to it multiple, multiple times. Um, it is phenomenal, and I've used it in my teaching to, um, to inform my students about it. Uh, I just, I think that this is an absolutely monumental thing to let people know, um, and to let them understand that, that this really um, impacted the country as a whole. Um, I happen to know that this uh, I mean, they obviously had, this did not make everything okay for them as they went out and for other black homesteaders as they continued on. Um, I have notes here that Indiana created a statute and in 1851 and Illinois did, Illinois did in 1853 just as other, um, as they saw other African Americans coming out even before the Homestead Acts just um, just not even allowing African Americans to be in their states, period. Mm -hmm. And so even before this happened, they were already facing mm -hmm. so many difficulties getting land. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so I, we need to look at that and we need to look at the, um, the consequences of this. But it's, it's such a phenomenal thing to bring this out and to bring in real stories of what they had to face. And you know what, that it, it, for me, that's, it's huge to work with real people. Um, I am not a historian by nature, so I get really excited working with real people. And it brings a whole reality that this law, this impact, I mean, we all still feel it today. I mean, it is still impacting us today. And, and we don't even know how much and we're just discovering the south right we're just discovering it and also since we now have these descendants they're communicating with each other mm -hmm. and we have one descendant we have two oris jenkins and dr mary clark and they discovered that their ancestors were from the same county in alabama well dr clark now has this spider web the spider web of all of these people in that county that are now homesteaders. And so it's the research, it's just, it keeps giving. Once you found one, it just keeps giving. And one of the things that I discovered just with my own ancestor is that the children of the homesteaders ended up marrying each other. So you talk about what happens with generational wealth. Well, these kids are, they're interacting. They are, they are landowners and they know each other. And so it's important for you to just keep studying what has happened to the families. And some of the families may have lost their land further down the road. But the fact is that it still has a 
just an impact that is a lasting impact. Thank you. Um, I, f I was at the, um, um, when you all did the presentation at the Black Museum in DC, yeah. I was there. And I was really, really uh, impressed by all of the work that had been done. Uh, I am from Arkansas, and I know from our family history that we had land. But at the time it was being discussed, I was just a little kid, you know, just so over overhear that. Um, first of all, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you said that uh, there was no race or uh, don't uh, note it on these papers. Are, as you find the black homesteaders, are there any races um, donate, uh, notated on those at all? Or, and the second one, um, Bernice, you said that you had found where your family had the homestead. What is there now? And have you looked into any possibility of reclamation? Or uh, or repair? The paper company owns the land right now. So, I mean, that's the response to, to that, yes. I do know what has happened to the land. And I have court cases, and I tracked the land all the way to 1965. Lots of information. You can find out about what happened in, in a book I wrote called Tracing Their Steps, uh, a memoir. And I take it from day one all the way until the present time. Um, what was your other About question? race. So, okay. you know, and that's like, that's, therein lies the challenge. I mean, you can't look at land records and find race. You just can't. And, you know, we're in the business of, of land records, and we are, um, you know, wanting people to discover their, their history, um, but the way that you would have to go back is, for, for us or for researchers, is to the censuses. So if you get a name and you get land records, and maybe you can go back to the census to double check and see what race is there. So there's a lot of back and forth to figure that. I don't have time for that. You know, and um, we're a small park, we have few people. And so it's very, very helpful when the descendants come to us. <laughs> right, and this is one of the reasons we reached out to yeah. individuals and said, let this be a descendant-driven project. Because you're not going to find this. I mean, I have a whole box of files. Mm -hmm. Am I gonna go through every single file to find maybe somebody said, that they were emancipated? No. <laughs> you know, even academics have a difficult time. Unless there is a community that has been established and they know this is a community of black homesteaders. The other process is on you. It's on the genealogist. It's on the family historian for you to do your research and to see if indeed your family owned land, and then to ask the question, how did they get that land? We've got a question back there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear my echo. <laughs> okay. So I had to check it. Um, two things, the first thing is about looking at the census to find out who owns land. I don't know if, uh, well, I'm a, assistant professor of information studies. So there's probably a way to mine some data, because this is a very large data set when you're talking about oh, census yeah. records. I don't know the process for that, but that's something that probably will happen in the near future. Um, and, you know, I'll poke around and see and keep in contact with you. That was just something that came up in that conversation. Yeah. Um, second question, of the stories that you have uh, collected from the homesteaders in the South? Were there uh, uh, some that revealed how people might have lost it, uh, lost the land, not over the years, but in me immediate time? Um, are know, there stories of loss? There is a recorded? really, that, that's a good question. And I think from my experience, it would be hard to find um, the reason for loss because then those land entry records would not be in existence. There would not be that story in those records because we wouldn't have made it to the last piece of the land patent, which is the end. And that's, that's when they all get kind of put into the National Archives as a complete set. So if you have a homestead that was not proved up on, um, 
you can get to at least the application paperwork through the National Archives, but you don't get the end of the story. You don't know what happened. And um, yeah, and it is each person, every story is so unique. Um, it really does take a genealogist's touch <laughs> to, like you said, mine that information to create a bigger story and overall broad picture of a person's life. And I do, do want to say very quickly thank you to the genealogy community because this has opened a whole world for our park site and I hope for the national parks as a whole because every park, if you had a family story that connected to their national significance would want it. I would certainly hope they would want it. Just throwing that out there. Yes. More than once I've gone to the Bureau of Land Management page and, and I see that my ancestors there, but then I don't know what to do with it. I didn't know that you could get uh, case files, so how, how do you do that? Okay, you can go to the uh, NARA website. The case files cost $50. And what you will need will be your application number, your patent number, and the land office. And that information is on the Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, but you know what? Tip and trick. Let's say all you have is the person's name, state, maybe the county that they're from. The archives will look into it and see if there's records there as well. So you go to the state archives? So the national. National. Yeah. The so National Archives. In Washington, D.C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they have an online presence. You can go online and get to their site and just go, records. And then that'll get you to um, oh, right. their, their yes. records ordering area. And you just fill in the, the, information, the information that you know okay. and send it on. And then they'll, they'll get back to you and say, nope, we didn't find anything. Or they'll say, yep, we found something. And um, $50 fee, no matter if it's one page or 100 pages. Um, and then you can get those documents as a digital file, which I highly suggest, but you can also um, get them printed off and mailed to you as well. Yeah. We've got another question that's Hi, over here. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, well, a uh, lady over here asked the question that I was going to ask, but um, I have found two homestead documents from my enslaved ancestors. And for years, I had been told that um, their slave owner had given them the land or must have given them the land. Um, but now I find uh, homestead documents where they actually homestead at the there land. Um, one is in Louisiana and one is in Mississippi. Uh, my question is, if I go through the application process and order these documents, will they possibly tell me anything about their previous enslaver, how much information is in there, if any, about enslaved ancestors? I have not seen anyone state that they have found that information in their case files. We do have one story, and the person suspects that the enslaver um, had something to do with them getting their land and they state that in their story because the person lived next door. We have another story, it was, it's very similar. But you're not gonna find that in the homestead record unless they serve as witnesses. And then that takes you to a whole nother level because you want to follow the witnesses. And a lot of times the witnesses you, you find are, are connected in that yes. way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you go down the rabbit hole that way and you see, oh, they're, they're related right. in, in this. And so sometimes um, that can answer that question. But yeah, and the land records itself, um, we do not find that. Okay, one question. Okay. One more quick. Is this on? Oh, yes. We're almost thank you. done. No, <laughs> Hi. Just... I, know, I know we're really rushed for time, so um, I'd like to speak to you afterwards. Yes. I'm the director for the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum in Charleston, and I've got a, pro I've got a proposal, a collaboration proposal, so I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards. 
Let's right. get to one second just real quick. Mm -hmm. We just want to thank everybody for coming out here and really thank you to the virtual crowd. We wanted to just make sure that we said goodbye and please to come out and uh, experience Homestead or experience us through uh, online and please write your Homestead stories. Thank you very much.